Good morning, good morning, uh, church. Um, trust that you are well again uh, this morning. We thank God that he's given us another time for us to be able to gather around his word and to hear what he has to say to us. This morning we continue on our series, uh, which we have titled the Township Series. The Township Series. We've titled it this way, not because um, we are preaching from the township, but it's because we are looking at issues that are affecting the township and we are going to the Word of God and seeing how the Bible speaks into them so that we can have a better worldview, so that we can have a more biblical worldview regarding the issues that we face. Sometimes it's easy for us to be Christians, even for years, without our worldview changing on certain issues. We can have a worldview on one issue, maybe on salvation, on spiritual issues, but you find that it doesn't affect other issues that we face on a daily basis. And until we do that, then then we're not going to fulfill what Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, where it says you must be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So it's important for us to be renewed in our minds because we live in the township. We, we, we live with certain issues. And sometimes we have beliefs, we have stuff that we have not thought about as to how does the Bible affect some of these things. So, so we, 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 we continue on that series. This morning's series, um, it's called A Response Against Tribalism. A Response Against Tribalism. If you don't know what that means, that's fine. Please just keep on listening. We will define it. Um, let us pray. Father, we thank you. For this time you've given us again, Lord, thank you that in Jesus, Lord, we have somebody who the world has never seen. In Jesus, uh, we have have a savior, we have a reconciler, mediator between God and man. I thank you for that. Thank you that we connected to him, we know him. Thank you that he he doesn't look at us, oh Father, according to how the world looks at us. But I thank you, Lord, that he he died for us and, and he looks at us, oh God, and just 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 as people oh god that 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 need him that are sinners but but that need grace thank you that we have new eyes with jesus he looks at us differently from others and i pray that our eyes will be open now as we start this in jesus name amen i remember during uh, 2016 local elections um i was in easter fabric I was just uh, walking down the road in Mamelodi West. There, there was, there was at the time there was tension uh, because the the ANC had put up a mayoral candidate by the name of Togo Disease Didiza. Um, this was the season of local elections, and you know how it is in that season. Everybody's putting up their posters. Everybody is letting you know that you must vote for them. The ANC had put up a candidate by the name of Togo Titiza, who was originally from KZN, but she had been part of Tswane since the early 90s. She had been living here. And I remember distinctly joining a conversation as I was walking with, you know, the two men discussing the matter, you know, as almost like Jesus, you know, joining the, the two men on the road to Emmaus as the way he was hearing what they were talking. And so I was joining these men and, and they were having a conversation about this hot topic, which was um, Togo Didiza, a Zulu woman who was put up by an ANC candidate to be a mayoral candidate here in Swane, which uh, obviously traditionally has mostly a Sutu slash Tswana speaking people, which would probably be in the majority. So this was the main topic of the day. So the guys were talking, they were going back and forth, and until I, one of the guys you know, insisted and said, we will not be ruled by Zulus. We cannot be ruled by Zulus. We do not want Togo Titiza to be our mayor. You know, even though Togo was, has been living here in Swane for the better f- half of her life, but the fact that she was Zulu was an unforgivable sin for them. It even appeared in the news and uh, eventually Tswane went with a man um, who was more of a local man, which I actually loved as well. And I think he's, he's still up until this day has been one of our best mayors uh, that we had. But what struck me 
that day was the, the idea that someone cannot be allowed to lead a tribe that they are not part of. Someone will not be allowed to lead a tribe that they are not part of. I think even here in Mamilodi, you know, the previous system uh, allocated areas to people according to their different tribes. There's areas that you will go to and you realize that in that area, most people speak Shang'an, right? There's other areas where you go to where you realize that in that specific area, that people speak Zulu. I've heard even in Daviton, there's an area called Emma Koseni, Emma Koseni, and you realize that there's a history of people or of, of a certain tribe of people that have been placed in certain areas. We can even extend it beyond our borders and, and go to other African countries. You go to Nigeria, you go to Rwanda, and you realize that there's, there's, this, there's this ethnic tension that has existed in our continent. It's not unique to our continent. I think it appears differently in European countries, but here it has a specific way in which it shows itself, right? What is the definition or, or the definition of uh, tribalism? This is how the dictionary defines it. The behavior and attitudes that stem from strong loyalty to one's own tribe or social group. Say that again. Tribalism. The behavior and attitudes that stem from a strong loyalty to one's tribe or social group. Now, as we continue on this message, we need to say from the onstart that being from a certain tribe or ethnic group is, is not a bad thing. In fact, I would go further and say it should be celebrated, right? We see this here, you know, in the township uh, especially, but it, it happens a lot, especially in rural areas. But here in urban areas, uh, you've seen it as you walk around here. You know, in certain areas, you'll see Tsongas kind of shut down the road, um, you know, in the weekend, and they'll have their music out. They'll have people wearing in Tsonga attire, and, and they'll have Ishpela, and, 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 and they will just celebrate Tsonga culture. You know, it's just the space where those people come in and they have a good time. And we, we, we even though I'm not Tsonga, but I can stand outside and I can appreciate that. And I can I say, wow, look at the music, look at the way they, they talk, look at the way they dress. It's so beautiful, right? Tswanas also celebrate their culture. Zulus also celebrate their rich heritage. In Mamelodi West, um, uh, before lockdown, you had, you had, you, had, you had a group of men that loved to celebrate petty culture, right? By, 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 by singing and, 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 and by dancing and by wearing, you know, a certain kind of attire. It's very also unique music that, that they have that has now has actually gone international. Some of the major guys coming from the Limpopo province have taken that music and they have made it to go international, right? And so, so there's, there's this beauty in how God has made all of us differently. In fact, in Acts 17 verse 26, it says, and he made from one man every nation of, of mankind to live on all of the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and their boundaries of their habitation, Acts 17, 26. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 tells us that God made man in his own image. Man was created in the image of God. So there is nothing wrong about all of us being from different tribes and from different ethnic groups. Here's the problem. Here is the problem. The problem is when we make those differences as a reason for us to think and act like we are better than anyone else. Say me that again. There is no problem in all of us coming from different ethnic backgrounds. The problem is when we make those differences a reason for us to think and act like we are better than the next person. Now let's go to the Bible and let's establish this. Let's go to the Word of God. Call Galatians chapter 3 verses 28 to 29. Galatians 3, 28 to 29. 
If you have it, say amen. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and has according to the promise. Did you notice what Paul is saying to the Galatians? Saying there is neither slave nor free, for they are all one in Christ. And then by virtue of being connected to Christ, Paul does an amazing, powerful thing. He connects everyone, whether Jew, whether male, whether female, whether slave, he connects them to the line of Abraham. He says, you are his according to the promise. Colossians 3 verse 9 to 11 even extend and include even more of the divisions that existed. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Here, Paul even extends, he extends the table. It's not just male nor female, but it's also Greek and Jew. It's also barbarian, Scythian, and all of those. He says all of those are included. It's important at this stage for us to do a bit of history and go to, to, to back to the first century to find out, is this thing that we are facing new? Why would Paul speak like this? Why would Paul say there's not a barbarian, no Scythian, no slave, no free, no male, no female, no, no. He, why would he say that? Could it be because also they faced similar ethnic tensions during that time? Could it be that they also faced all of these divisions that we are also facing during this time? Just a bit of history on who were the barbarians? Why would Paul say that? That there is neither Jew nor Greek in barbarians. The barbarians was the people according to Greeks, because the Greek was the superpower during the time. They had the power to define and to name who is what and who is where. And so they, they named this group of people the barbarians because they spoke a strange language. When the Greeks had barbarians, Hababulela, they were hearing ba 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 So they named them barbarians because they couldn't understand their language. It's because, according to them, they spoke an unintelligible language to a Greek person. It was it was not understood. They said a barbarian was of a strange race geographically, ethnographically, he was foreign to the Greek. In classical times, Egypt, Persia were the barbarians. But the, 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 the division didn't just stop there. The Greeks also divided the barbarians into various ethnic groups. And they normally labeled them according to location or language of people. Are you seeing connections already? Are you seeing connections between how we label people today according to locations and according to the language of people? The way that the Greeks labeled the world at the time was that they had, uh, towards the West, they called the people there the Celts who lived there. Towards the North, they called the people the, the Scythians. We'll talk about them now because Paul says there's no barbarian or Scythian. Toward the east, they had the Indians or the East Ethiopians. And towards the south, they had the Ethiopians, right? Which was today, which would we call Africans. At the time, the borders were not, you know, constructed the way that they're constructed. You just had people that were, were south 
and they called us the Ethiopians. Now let's talk about the Scythians. Scythians had a reputation of being the lowest of the barbarians. The Greeks' verbs constructed from their name were used to describe uh, people that were fallen victims, people that were drinking immoderately. Abando beba puza ngendlela to the Greeks that was immoderate. People who were drinking unmixed wine, they were described as being crude in their speech. Gushugut maba kuluma, bebanga kulumi, right? The way that the the Greeks you know, we we're, we're, we're speaking because the Greeks were very big on speech. You know, the very, very big on having philosophers and eloquent. Well, when they had these different people called the Massythians, which were lower than the barbarians, they started to give them names, right? The prejudice didn't just go against Scythians. It also went against the Ethiopians, the Ethi- Ethiopians, right? Which today would be would be Africans. You know, it, Ethiopians, the, you know, the way they describe it was anyone who was um, living in the region to the far south of Greece, as I was saying. The way that they describe the Ethiopians is, is, is through their physical features. They said their physical features were noted, but not normally, uh, they were not in a normal way, the physical features. They said the sun had discolored their bodies with a murky dark bloom and curl they are here, fusing it into unincreasable forms of fire. They, they, they describe Ethiopians as having a savage spirit, savage spirit, not so much in temperament, but in their ways of living. They said that the way that the Ethiopians were living was not civilized. The way that the Ethiopians were living was not according to the way that Greeks were living. They said they had long nails, they have shrill voices, and they are far removed from human kindness to one another. It's how the Greeks described the Ethiopians. And so what is Paul doing when he's talking about this to the Colossians, to the Galatians? Paul is using the gospel to address divisions even in the early church. Paul didn't want Greeks to come to church with that mentality from the world that they are better than the barbarians. He didn't want the barbarians to feel that they are inferior because they are not like the Greeks, because they don't speak like the Greeks, because their culture is not like the Greeks, because their music is not like the Greeks, because their tradition is not like the Greeks. He didn't want them to feel inferior, especially when they came to Christ. Paul showed them that in Christ we are equal. We are unique in our cultures, but we are equal in the sight of God. Can you say amen? When he says there is no Greek, no barbarian, he's not saying you lose your culture or your heritage, but he's saying there's no partiality. There's not one person who thinks that because the culture around them respects them for whatever advantage they have, Therefore, in the church, we must respect them because of the same things that the world respects them of. No, he's saying Christ is the great equalizer. Jesus is the great equalizer. He's the great leveler. He levels things, which is so that we are all now equal on the playing field. So that we don't look at the next person and we see them or describe them or know them according to the flesh or see someone who is of a lesser value because of how the world describes them. Paul wants them to know that in Christ, neither of those distinctions exist. Amen. So what has Jesus come to do? I call him the great equalizer. (laughs) Jesus is the great equalizer. If ever there was a person who lived free from prejudice, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was no respecter of persons. He received all men and women alike. Remember the woman who was a sinner? Luke 7, verse 36 to 50. He received tax collectors and sinners. Luke 15, verse 1 to 2. In fact, that's what got him into trouble with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He went to all people alike, sometimes going out of his way to show that his mission was for all people. Remember, with a Samaritan woman, Jesus takes a different route. 
and he has a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her. Now, it's true that during the time Jesus appears to limit his activity to the Jews, but, but he still, he never turned away a believing Gentile. Remember the Sarophician woman, Matthew 15, verse 21 to 28? Remember the centurion, Matthew 8, verse 5 to 13? The Greeks, John 12 to 20 to 25? In his teaching, Jesus often uses positive Gentiles as examples to shame the Jews for their lack of accepting the gospel. Jesus' last words when he was talking about the Great Commission, he addresses to all nations. He addresses it to all nations. Jesus' last act was the cleansing of the court of the Gentiles at the temple so that God's house could fulfill its true purpose as a house of prayer for all the nations. Mark 11, 17. It is interesting to know that even Jesus' enemies recognize his lack of prejudice. They said of him, you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Luke 20, verse 21. Jesus comes as a Messiah to reign in justice. This means that he's the great equalizer. He's the great leveler. Remember even the Pharisees, when the Pharisee and the tax collectors were praying, remember that? Jesus doesn't look at what the people say about the tax collector. He doesn't look at the cultural stereotype of a tax collector. Or he doesn't look at the Pharisee to say, oh, because society respects Pharisee, I'm going to define them according to that. What does Jesus say? He concludes in Luke 18, verse 9 to 14. He says, I tell you, this man, but the text collector who repented, went down to his house justified rather than the other one. The women of the Pharisees thank God that he was not like other people, even this text collector. Eh? Society would have said, ah, Vela, you are telling the truth. We are not like them. Vela, Vela, Siabazu, these text collectors are like this. Jesus doesn't look at it that way. He says, everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. He redefines how people look at others. He defined them, the, the, the tax collector because he repented of his sin and said that he's justified. Jesus also created a new identity for all. He created a new identity. Identity that will supersede all previous racial distinctions. So in Jesus, we have a different person. We have a different person who, who gives a new identity, identity that is rooted in a spiritual rebirth from a common heavenly father. Christians are now called sons of God, right? John 1, verse 11 to 13. And which means that Christians all have Christ as their brother. Matthew 12, verse 49 to 50. And most importantly, we have one another as brothers. Matthew 23, verse 8. Jesus then tells those who would follow him that they have a new identity as sons of God in which there is no room for prejudice. The identity is offered without partiality to all. It is a product of no human effort. So there is no room for prejudicial boasting. Amen. The early church continues. The Great Commission, right? Acts chapter 1 verse 8. You see that it goes in geographical. It goes beyond geography. It works itself out in both geography and ethnic terms. Right? The gospel crosses all kinds of barriers. As it, as it goes to the Palestinian, the Jewish Christian, Hellenistic Jews, it goes to everybody. They go to Samaritan. They go to the Samaritan. Acts 8 verse 4 to 17. They convert others to Christianity, Acts 8, 26 to 40. The Gentile God fear and Nicodemus, right? The gospel reaches him as well. The emphasis is that this message is for all people, even for those who are far off. That's how they say it. So the gospel is the only message that can free us of prejudice against one another. This is what I want to say. Make sure your identity of who you are as a Christian is from Christ not culture. Make sure for your identity of who you, are, who you are as a Christian, who you grow from Christ, not from your culture. Celebrate uniqueness in each other. Let's do that. 
but never allow your tribe's way of doing things to define how you treat one another. Never allow how people around you do things to define how you treat a fellow image bearer. Whether someone is from Limpopo, whether somebody is from Zimbabwe, whether somebody is from KZN, that shouldn't define how you treat them. It's like the way sometimes we treat one another. It's like it's like you look at Jesus and the way that, you know, that prayer between the Pharisee and the tax collector. If Jesus was doing the way we are doing things, would have looked at the Pharisee before even they even prayed, would have said, no, the Pharisee is fine. The Pharisee is a good guy and the tax collector is bad. But Jesus doesn't do that. He looks at diff- stuff differently. Sometimes we can treat people better because we are, we, are, we are from the same place, right? Or we speak the same language. And we treat our fellow brothers in Christ differently because they are not from our tribe. That is undermining the work of reconciliation by Christ on the cross. Remember how the Bible divides people. It doesn't divide people according to who's from where and whatever. It says there's those who are sinners and there's those that are in Christ. Those who are sinners, those are in Christ. And when we think of those who are sinners, right? Who, 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 who in the world is not a sinner? Who in the world can say that, me now, I'm not a sinner, I am better? Nobody can say that. Nobody can say that. And so all of us are equal. Is there any hate or prejudice in your heart that you need to repent of this morning? Is there any hate or prejudice in your heart that you need to repent of this morning? We can talk about all kinds of things and fight all kinds of things. But until we allow the gospel to change the way we look at one another, until there, our identity in Christ becomes bigger, superior than our identity in our ethnic groups, then we are not going to win. We are not going to be together as Christians. Amen.